One more for the road, baby. Bring this up just a little bit. Yep. Okay. Alrighty. Yep. Okay. Ooh, very nice. Ooh, yes. Holy strain and new strain. And then I tuned up the uh, tuners because I wasn't able to hold traction. So the mandola is basically the first four strings on a guitar, right? before and that's why we had popping is because I had two different mics it was turned up too high thank you for the thumbs up I appreciate that been pretty tired lately you know Pushing myself on a deep emotional level because this is all personal to me. Very personal. Because of what the sovereignty goddess represents, you know.
All right. Do some more reading. Mandola sounding excellent. So happy about that. I uh, kind of stripped it down before to like uh, less strings, you know. I'll take this hat off. It's hot. It's hot. Getting warm out here, baby. Getting warm. I'm gonna shrink this down, huh? Yeah. We talk about oh, oh, got something overhead, helicopter or something. The uh, Arcona show. So when I went to that show, I went in full garb. Yep. My uh, Scottish vest. Right. My Renaissance shirt. Yep. Yep. And uh, uh, they noticed. Because a lot of people didn't. Right. Right. And they didn't comprehend the significance of the folk element. Right. But that is key note as far as uh, Arcona goes because. No, I'm not saying one person is the end all and be all, but she definitely presents herself as that. And uh, wow, wow. There was definitely a very strong vibe in the room. We'll just say that. You know, and at one point, I was standing there looking up on stage and I hit a note vocally. I was able to cut through the loudness in the room. I don't know if you realize how loud a metal show is. It was so loud that she heard me and looked at me directly. No, I'm not joking. It was only because she had inspired me. Her passion was strong, right? I was going to keep that to myself as a private situation, but and I will. I didn't describe it in full, but I definitely felt of her presence. Right, because I do think she's. She, I believe she is married to the lead guitarist. That's her husband, the big dude with the beard, long hair. Right. But she came out of folk culture, definitely. And you go back and you see her old stuff. It's all folkish, but there is always a folkish element, such as even this shirt. Right. Right. Bam. Bam. Right? right? And to and me, he, the fire, fire is the is full the soul, soul itself. That's, that's the that's flame. flame. That's why I keep why going back, back to that. That, that is the is eternal, eternal flame. flame. So, so, the, the, the goth, goth culture, culture, right? Right? was also on the cusp of, we were still into metal. Uh, that was a big thing before hip hop took over, right? So I got raised with that. And uh, so I would see my, go to my friend's house and he was amazing. He could play professionally uh, in high school. He could play anything, any metal song you could think of. It was amazing to watch this guy play. I was just like, wow, because he's like, you know, but that's on an electric and that's definitely easier than an acoustic. I don't care what any of these electric players tell me, acoustic's harder, period. Eventually, I have, I have one electric guitar. That is it. I have an Epiphone Traditional Pro. So I'll go get some strings for that eventually. And then I can do some metal stuff on that guitar. But I went years, like, without 
having an electric. And I rarely ever play it. I play my acoustics all the time. But I was thinking, you know, expansion because I love folk metal as well. But the core will always be acoustic folk music. Always. And so even in a breakdown, I will still have music where all the MP3 player people won't. You see, so that is why folk music was central, you know. Uh, there wasn't MP3 player and pre-recorded this or that. Now imagine before recordings, music would have been even more supreme and it's been shrunk down, right? It's a social influencer, but there's no potency left, right? Where that's why I go to something with the folkish element because it has potency. It's connected to a deep emotional um, heart energy. But I also consider that there are those who abuse that, right? Uh, I'll be honest, I didn't care for Finn Troll or whoever the hell that was, whatever. I went for Arcona, that was it, because of Masha and that band, specifically. I went, yup, Volva's in town, hip, hip. I went and saw, very good show, but everything is in a private nature in a certain context, you know? And then this whole anti-Russia bullshit going on, right? In the propaganda, whatever. All sides could be manipulated at any given point, right? But Russia, as in the Kiev Rus, right? The Rus tribe was central and old, right? I was looking around, I typed in my dad's name just to see what would pop up since he was a researcher. And of course my dad's name popped up and I found some of his research online that made me feel good. My dad died eight years ago, but it doesn't feel like a day has passed since I was in that room. It is a permanent memory. So I have to go back and view it in a different context in that I chose to say, okay, I will face everything about myself that is out of balance. I will not run. That is a very important rite of passage. And it was very painful, but it very, very important. It's like a wound, right? That's festered and you have to clean that wound out or it will become diseased, right? And it will take the remaining of the limb because it was not cleansed. So to me, on a spiritual soul level, that's reality. And so in order to heal myself, I have to attune to the sovereignty goddess who in many ways has been dishonored and disrespected for so long that it's almost to the point of people forgetting, right? Technology became God, uh-uh, or goddess, whatever you want to call it. I wrote a poem about that many years ago, where I predicted that technology would replace the concept of divine authority, right? But that consciousness I do not feel will disappear. It is forever and eternal and will awaken in us if we acknowledge it and seek it. But what is the keynote, see from writers of the she is that Lou in order to get his position had to freely choose it, right? And that is what a true leader is. They freely choose to serve the people with 100% love, right? That means no deception whatsoever. But then you must be sharp and aware because there are those who will betray to gain, right? Position, title, money. 
look at what the elites did. I'll bring it up again. The overexpansion of the Swedish kings, right? Pushing, not listening to the vulvas anymore, are they? What happened? They started losing land. Why? Because that is sovereignty goddess yet again. And somehow they think that they could just escape that, right? And they are the supreme power. That's what's up. So it's like, if, in my opinion, if they could, they would destroy the goddess and try to take her power because they don't want to earn power, right? They never did. And so they don't truly have real sovereignty, do they? They are in disharmony with the sovereignty of the land. And that's a big problem. So we can't fix the overall large problem, right? But we can fix ourselves. And we can say, well, we will live in harmony with the sovereignty of the land. And we will honor the sovereignty goddess, the grandmother and grandfather of ancient old of our tribe. We can choose that, right? Not everybody will. And as I've discovered, a small handful is about all there will be. Okay. Keep in mind Navy SEAL training that only 30% of the 100% of the class even graduate. Now, into an even smaller percentage of who becomes leadership. And then that would give you an idea of what Lou represents. And he's doing that at what? 16 years old? You see, you would have advanced at a younger age because the rites of passage would have happened at a younger age. And that would have been either your coming of age as a boy to a man or a girl to a woman. With that said, the Sea God's Plan, Chapter 4. No, no, no. This will never do. A fussy voice said with sharp disapproval. A small figure dressed like the others in a multi-hued robe appeared from behind the grotesque creature and stood, hands on hips, looking up at it and shaking his head. It is certainly disgusting, that I will admit. But what good would it be against the Fomor? Why, if they saw it, they would probably try to carve the poor thing up for their supper, for their supper. And some of them are more ugly than it is, than it is. He waved a dismissing hand at the thing. Now get away with you, he ordered curtly. And with miraculous obedience, the creature instantly began to disappear. It dissolved like a cloud dissipated by a sudden wind, blown into tatters that floated up through the smoke hole in the ceiling's peak. Soon, nothing remained but the embers of a small fire in the pit from which rose a thin thread of gray smoke. Remember, the ember that burns deep within the folk soul heart. Ah, the flame. Hold the flame. Lou and his companions all relaxed and released their grips on their weapons. All four had been ready to charge in. Now seeing the little man, they understood. For he was finned gold, high druid of the Tuatha de Danon. Finned gold, I object your criticism, said an imposing gray haired druid. He pulled himself stiffly up to his considerable height to glare down at his small colleague. I use some of my best skills to conjure that. Fingol stepped toward the group of other druids. They were an imposing lot, mostly tall, lean, 
aristocratic men with strong features and an air of great dignity. Indeed, the Druids were the most influential group in the Dejanon society, rivaling even the High King in power. But Fingol, a head shorter than any of the rest, was not intimidated. His manner toward them was that of a scolding teacher to unruly small boys. If that is your best, then it only proves how decayed your skills have become from long neglect, he replied uncompromisingly. What? Why, how dare you to? The other began in an outraged splutter. Fingol cut him off. Listen, you and all the rest of you, he said fiercely, his high voice crackling like a whip. While most of you spent these past years cowering in your hiding places and praying to Danu that the Fomor wouldn't find you, I was at work. I was using my talent in sorcery to protect other teachers and artists. Ress had condemned. Feel that connect. My skills are sharper than ever in my life. More than a match for any for more, and I'm betting more than a match for any of you. Or would one of you be wishing to give them a test? We will always be tested. He glared round at them, his eyes fixing most challengingly on the tall druid. None replied. They knew the truth of his words. Mm -hmm. See, they honor wisdom. They were humble before wisdom, that is my point. Fine then, he said. Now you're all as out of practice as our warrior friends outside. So, we will practice, practice, and practice. Every skill that we learn from our teachers in the four cities may be needed, and they will be. As sooner than we thought, I'm afraid, Lou called crossed the room to him. Striding forward with his companions, Fingol looked round toward them. He had a small, featured, cunning face set below a broad forehead. It lit now with pleasure as he saw his friends. Well, you've come back, he said. Then the ominous words of Lou registered and his expression clouded. But what do you mean? What's wrong? It's the Fomor, Lou explained. They're gathering a huge army, and Bress himself is leading them. Bress, exclaimed the druid, and murmurs of concern ran through the group of his colleagues. We haven't many days in which to prepare, Lou went on. We're meeting tonight in Nuada's quarters to discuss our plans. So that's your top one percentile of leadership, right? But until then, don't speak of this to anyone. That's right, they have to keep it private and secret, right? Or their plans will be discovered. I understand, Pingol said. We'll surely all be there. He looked at the other druids. In the meantime, we'd best be going on with our work, hadn't we? From the look of our warriors, our folk soul light may be the best defense we'll have. The four warriors, I added that, of course. <laughs> the four warriors left the druids and moved back through the hall to the raised platform at the back where the High King and his champions sat at feasts. 
On the long table, there were set out plates of cheeses and bread, dried meat. See, that would have been in use. Why? To survive. That is why salt was so important, because you could survive year-round, whether you had drought, famine, whatever. You had saved it when it was available. Keynote to survive. Dried meat and fruit and large pitchers of ale. The dog that helped himself to a plate of food took up a whole pitcher and sat down heavily on one of the large benches. He sounds like me. <laughs> I'm going to watch this, he said. Should be a good bit of entertainment. Morgan sat down too, refusing the ale the dog that held out folding her cloak tightly about her, staring ahead, silent and expressionless. I'll be back to join you, Lou promised. I just want to tell Ain and Dolta that we're back. Turned away toward the wooden stairway beside the platform and found Gila falling in beside him. He gave him a curious look. I thought you were going to eat first. The clown shrugged. It'll wait a bit. I want to see them too. Across the room, the druids were back at their practice. Fingol gestured one of the group forward. He was a young man and looked very uncertain. Say, you are the newest of our group. So that's just C E. So I don't know exactly how to say that, but you know. Said Fingol. See what you can conjure that might frighten the Fomor. As Lou and Gila started up the stairs, they heard the young druid's incantation begin. They were nearing the top when there came a muffled boom and a bright flash of light from below. Then came Fingol's voice, raised in sharp annoyance. I ask for frightening, and what is it I get? Ah, sheep. And a dead one at that. I think it's only asleep, in goal, came the weak, defensive voice of hapless say. Is it? With all four feet straight up that way? Was the little druid biting? Retort. Gila flashed a broad grin at Reed. Porter Fingol. He's got his hands full with the lot of pompous tricksters. Mm -hmm. Only a handful of real sorcerers in the whole bunch of them. See? Strong intention and commitment, that's why. Or the lack thereof. The two reached the top of the stairs. There, a long room ran along the back curve of the hall, above the High King's da dais. Okay. Now remember, that also equates to potency. Uh-huh. It was open on the inside to the hall, edged by a low gallery rail. On the outside was a row of windows, now all open, allowing sunlight to flood the room. A few tables, Pardon me. The few tables and stools that furnished the room were moved to the sides, leaving the center clear. There, two women sat upon the floor amidst the piles of wooden pla plaques, sections of cloth and hide, metal sheets and thin slabs of slate, all marked with crude maps. Both women were of striking appearance but in quite different ways. One looked to be in her thirties, but still maintaining the freshness and physical vitality of a much younger woman. She was stolidly built, not heavy limbed, but certainly not frail. She was quite handsome, I would say quite beautiful. Broad featured, her face dark complected and crowned by a wealth of black hair, lightly salted and gray. Her expression was at this moment set in concentration, her dark eyes flashing with energy. She was sorting the piles with sharp, impatient gestures and grumbling the while. The other woman was much younger, 
From her face, she seemed hardly more than a girl. Her features were open, smooth, and pleasant rather than beautiful, but somehow more natural and satisfying for that. Her cheeks were high and round, and her small nose was dusty, lightly with freckles. Fair hair with a cast of burnished copper was loosely plaited, plaited at her neck. Her figure, however, belied her youthful look. She was in shape, indisputably, a woman. And as she sat there, unaware of the arrival of the men, Lou let his gaze dwell on her, admiring her. It took in this, this, okay, hold on. I have to, I have to really lay into this because I love women. <laughs> Can't help it. It took, it, took, it took in the supple curves, the slender waist, the soft swell of hip revealed by the short, belted warrior's tunic that she wore. He lingered especially over the length of slim, white legs, the ankles accentuated by the leather thongs of her shoes winding about the calves. His eyes followed their line on up past her knees toward mm, Lou, said a surprised and happy voice. Yeah, Lou's a little distracted. <laughs> he jerked and looked up to meet the frank gaze of bright green eyes. He flushed guiltily. I would say he was a little shy. But she only smiled at him with warm welcome. The woman beside her wasn't smiling, however. When she saw who had come, she bent a sharp glare upon Gila that would have skewered him like a pig carcass if it had been of iron. Whoosh. That's a pretty sharp look there. So you have come back from your bit of adventuring, have ya? She said with heat. It makes me feel good to know you're so glad to see us safe, Gila replied with his usual foolish smile. But she wasn't to be soothed. Don't try your charming manner on me again. You stand in there so full of yourself, and with your face still rosy from the fresh wind and the sun on it. She jumped up from the piles and advanced on him. Look at us, penned up here in this dark and smoky hall for these three days past. Filthy from all these bits of trash, our backs breaking from going through them. We should have been with you. It was important work you were doing, Gila told her in a defensive tone. We'll need the map you can make from all these bits. It's done, she said. But for our last checking, all the pieces of iron in one great chart. And if it was so important, why weren't you here doing it yourself? Just because your Mananan, the great sea god, told you, please, he protested quickly and looked round toward the stair head to be sure no one else had intruded upon them and overheard this astonishing revelation. For it was true that this peculiar gawky being was actually Mananan Maklir, known to those of Ayr as the god of the sea, who inhabited a mystical Ayr prote isle protected by sorcery and savage monsters of the ocean depths. Now also remember that when Mananan is not in the sea, he can be killed. Right? right? When he's on the land, he is, he is mortal. He's really strong as a mortal, but he's still a mortal. In reality, he was a subject of Queen Danu of Tirnanog, sent out by her to act secretly as a guardian for the proud Day Danans. And I would add with Queen Danu, that is a direct sovereignty goddess link. Not long after the Day Danans had come to Aya, 
from the distant Blessed Isles. Danu had established an outpost for him on a small island near to Aya. She had granted him vast powers over the sea and its creatures. See, she granted the power again, the, the sovereignty goddess, over and over again, central. But these were only to be used to protect this outpost and mask the true nature of his presence there. For Danu had promised that she would not interfere with the Day Danon's acting of their own free will. There it is again, free will. You must freely choose to serve the sovereignty goddess, period. No folk soul of Tir Nanog would be used in Ayer unless that independent-minded race wished for it. The folk soul light. I'm using that instead of magic, since I know what magi is. It's Persian origin. Anyway, as a result, Mananan had nothing to sustain him while in Aya, except his own cunning, his fighting skills, and a few conjuring tricks, like his bottomless cloak. But to the light-hearted adventurer, this only made his task a more exciting challenge. In the disguise of an awkward, harmless clown, he was able to move about ire unnoticed, helping the Day Danons in their struggle for freedom. Now having carefully made certain that he and his companions were alone in the hall's upper room, he abruptly dropped the higher voice and foolish manner of the clown, taking on a more assured and refined manner of Mananan. You must remember, he cautioned urgently, only the four of us can know who I am. See, I put his life at risk. And why is that? She asked sarcastically. But she's pushing him because she knows what's going to get his attention. It's so you can be free to play the fool. Not that it doesn't suit you. And go off on more little adventures. Be careful, Tolta. Menanen cautioned, his voice tinged with irritation. Even from you, I'll take only so much. Besides, Tolta, In said reasonably, my brother didn't force us to do this. We did volunteer. Thank you, sister for that stout defense. The tall man said graciously, and I assure you both that you'll not be made to do such a thing again. But I would also say this is under extreme strain and stress, and they're getting ready for a war to pop off, right? And they don't have a lot of time. Well, all right then, Tolta agreed, grudgingly. She walked to Lou and threw her arms about him, giving him a great, crushing hug. I'm glad to see you back safely, she told him, smiling at last. As an afterthought, she threw to Mananan. And you too. Show us what you've done, Mananan urged. It's over here, Tolta said, directing him to a large table against the outer wall. She unrolled a great dressed deer hide on which a large and detailed chart had been painstakingly drawn. Mountains, rivers, inlets, and other geographic features were included. See here, she said, pointing out all the small circles. See here, scattered across the island. All the circles scattered across the island, okay? We've tried to mark where every settlement is and show the roads that link them. Marvelous work, the tall man said, bending over it to examine its details more closely. Really marvelous work. Don't you think so, Lou? Boost those ladies up. They worked hard, especially Telka. But Lou was paying no attention. Yeah. <laughs> of course not. It was all on aim. 
He stepped forward and held out a hand to help her up from her seat amidst the piles. As she rose, she brushed back some stray hairs from her face and then smiled to see how black her hand was. It really is filthy work, she said. I must be covered with it. You look fine to me, Lou assured her, Haha. continuing to hold her other hand. Mananan looked back and noticed a familiar, foolish expression on Lou's face. His eyes narrowed, and he called sharply to the young warrior, Lou! The young man tore his gaze from Ain and turned it to his tall comrade. Yes, we've got to talk now, the other said seriously, turning from the map and propping his lanky form against the table. That's why I wanted to come up here. The others can't hear this. Curious, Lou and the two women took seats on the benches. Her brother's tone of voice aroused Ain's concern. That's right. When man and Ann starts getting nervous, the shit's about to go down. You're right. You're right. Mananan, what's wrong? Why are you back in Tara so soon? Bress is not dead, the man answered. Tersely. He's come back to Aya and he is gathering an army of Fomor. We didn't guess those monsters could react to the fast, that fast to the horizon. Now all the Daedanons are in great danger. Lou, what do you think are the possibilities of our friends gathering their forces or restoring strength to their warriors in time? I would say it will be difficult, Lou replied. Charitable. Mm. I'd say it will be impossible to survive. They are going to need our help. But we are helping them, Lou said, not understanding. <laughs> It'll take a little more than that, Mananan said. It will take the powers of Danu, has entrusted to us. Think, Lou, of the gifts of the four cities. Lou recalled his first visit to that isle. Mananan called his home. There, in the strange underground dwelling known as the She, this remarkable being had shown him the four objects that Queen Danu had sent to aid the Day Danon cause. Two of those objects had already been put to use. Here it is. One was the Leofel, the Stone of Truth which had established Nuada's right to the throne as High King. Now remember, it is supposed to sing out when the High King sits upon it. What does that possibly represent? Sovereignty of the land and the animism and the spirit of the land singing out when the true king sits upon the stone. Stone of truth. Sword of Truth, connected. The second was the sword ah, that Lou carried, an unbreakable blade whose aura of strength endowed Lou with the spirits of a champion. But there were two others still awaiting their time. Now that is also the greater folk soul of your tribe coming to your aid, because you are in harmony with your path. <laughs> Your intention is pure. It is the only way you receive that folk soul light, the greater light, rather than the lesser light, in my opinion, of course. A spear containing a terrible energy and a massive cauldron with its own unique powers. He understood what Mananan was speaking of. Of course, the cauldron. Its power can restore the strength of anyone who eats from it. Mananan nodded. Now think about the representation. You honored the sovereignty of the land. Now you are partaking of the cauldron and everything in the cauldron came from the land. 
So therefore, the potency is far greater than just, you know, picking something and eating it without any kind of honor or respect for what you are partaking of. Danu foresaw that it would be needed. As she did, the Leah failed, and your own answerer. You're right, Lou agreed. We should start for it at once. No, said Mananan, lifting a restraining hand. I'll see to that. You have another task. The cauldron will be little good if the warriors are not hosted. That's what you have to do. The riders of the she can help you. Do it in time. That's right. They have to restore the strength, right, and vitality of all of those lower class warriors. That is their, I don't want to say lower class, but you know what I'm saying, lower tier. Or they will not have the strength. So that's where leadership comes in. That you come back to strengthen those people rather than sucking everything into yourself like breasts and being a selfish pig, all right? And that does not honor the sovereignty of the land. So honoring the sovereignty of the land allows the land to come to your aid since it is imbued with the sovereignty god goddess's power. Okay. But why do I have to do that? The young warrior wondered. Anyone could travel with them. I'd rather go with you. You must do this. You are the champion of the she. The riders are charged by Danu to protect and obey you. Champion, Lou said and laughed ruefully. Champion, <laughs> it's certain I don't feel like one. It doesn't matter what you feel. You are a champion. The son of Sion, Mananan reminded him. You are the one the prophecy has said will lead us, will lead the day to nons. They know it. They can feel the power in you. You heard what Fibon said. Only you can convince them that they can rise against the Fumor. Lu shook his head. Mananan, I feel as if I'm being used by you, as I was before. You're in control, and I have no will. Whoa. This is your own destiny, using you, not me. Remember, he accepted the choice. So he's going through a conflict, right? Where he's having to be tested over and over again, raising his tier of leadership, right? Preparing for the final battle, but he's not there yet. The tall man protested, and you freely accepted it, as I said. From that, from the moment you chose to become the champion of the she and fulfill the prophecies. You had no self, as he serves, well, I don't agree with that necessarily, but he serves the greater folk soul. So it is no longer just about him, right? It's about the greater whole of the tribe, which is true kingship or queenship. This idea had not been put so bluntly to Lou by his mentor before. It seemed to Lou that Mananan's nature had become more openly domineering. He has to. The war is about to happen, right? He's getting hardcore. And the idea disturbed him. He felt confused. But he's young. He's like 16 years old. What do you expect? Right? I'm going outside for a time, he announced abruptly. I need to think a bit. He got up and crossed the room to a door in the outer wall. He pushed it open and stepped through onto a wooden bridge. See, the bri everything is symbolic in this book. I love that. How this art, how this author does. This is so rare for me to find a book written like this, but it's awesome. You know, it linked this upper level of the hall to the walkway around the top of the palisade. He crossed to the walkway and stood staring out cross-eyed in the town below. He tried to make some order of many of the many feelings mixed within him. I would also note that this is like definitely the style that I come across with, if you've noticed. But moving forward, the more experienced I become as an individual, 
the more likely it is that I can express that in a clear and very defined manner, right? I'm refining. That's what this whole year is about. Okay. He was mostly bothered by the sense that his life was still not his own. See, that's the greater responsibility that he has to realize that he has. That he, he, it is a process, right? Of taking responsibility and leadership. It is not easy. He realized that Mananan had controlled it since his childhood, manipulating him so that he would play out his intended role. No. He was guiding him. He comprehended on a higher level something that Lou did not. So he could only, you know, he has to tear him up. He can't just give him top level right off the bat. He's got to earn it or he will not be able to handle the power, right, at all. It will get out of control and then he would self-destruct. That's reality. He felt a presence beside him. A hand moved out to rest lightly on his arm. He turned and looked into the eyes so brilliantly green, so knowing that they could plumb every depth of him. You know, not so many days ago, I was just a boy living on the tiny isle, he told her. I thought then that my only destiny would be to stay there, fishing and playing my game. I wonder sometimes if I wouldn't have been happier knowing nothing else. Her expression grew worried. Lou, what's wrong? It's just your brother. I don't know. He's taken so much control. That's because Lou has to step up and take control. He's doing what he thinks is right to help the day Danons with freedom. She reasoned. She's right. She is wise. If the time is short, it seems the only way. See, she knows. I suppose that's true enough, he admitted. I only wish that it was my idea or my choice, or anything to do with my own will. It is. He chose it. It will be over soon, she promised soothingly. It will be over soon. Then, you can be your own. Both of us can. Her smile raised a responding smile from him. He lifted a hand to lay against the softness of her cheek. Notice that that power was something that only a woman had. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Women are powerful. Women are powerful. Yep. yep. I missed, I missed you, you, he told her. He told her. And I missed, and I missed you. you. But that won't that be won't happening happen again. again. This, time, this time, we won't, we won't be, separated. be separated. I'll, I'll ride, ride with you. With you. you will not, not, said Mananen's voice behind them. them. They turned to see him crossing, crossing the bridge, the bridge toward, toward them. them. What do you what mean? Ain asked him. Clearly puzzled. You're not, You're going, not with going with him, with him he said flatly. flatly. Lou will ride, ride alone. alone. You and Tolta will stay here at Tara. Her puzzlement turned to astonishment and anger. What? what? She cried. But you but just you promised. promised. I promised that I wouldn't have you doing any more tasks like this map, he said, lifting it the rolled up chart he was carrying. But you can join in the training of the warriors here. Or you can organize the Dayton on women. Right? Even the women were ready for war. Yeah, no pretty princess here. Hmm, beautiful, but you know what I'm saying. She's got some grit. Like Annie Oakley. Your help is needed at Tara. Lou doesn't need it. It's true. It's true. So you see, you have to be wise as a leader, and that is what he's teaching Lou. He has to learn discernment and how to use the people that are with him, not manipulate or abuse. No, working together in an interdependent function. Right. 
higher tiered function. Anyway, leadership. Helping Lou fulfill his mission in Ayer is as much my work as yours, brother, she said hotly. You can't let him go alone. He's a warrior, a champion. He's a boy. He can't handle this by himself. Oh, shit. Thank you, Lou put in, hurt by her evaluation of his skill. Oh, but that will cause him to rise, watch. You're not much more than a girl yourself. Oh, shit, challenged both of them. I'm sorry, Louie, she told him. But you admitted to me that you still had doubts. And you know I've had more experience than you. See, you can't let doubt enter. Mm -mm. Especially not before a big battle. You got to keep going on. Push doubt to the side. Eliminate it. Clean it from yourself. I've been in more difficult places and fought more battles. Lou doesn't need you now, Mananan said stolidly. He needs to act alone, and his last doubts will disappear. Very important. There's no reason for you to risk yourself unnecessarily. He's, he does need me, and you can't speak to me of risks until now I've taken as many as you. And you've never been concerned. What is it? What's changed your mind? There's no, there's more to it than that. He has to do it alone to prove himself, right? Mananan hesitated. The words came reluctantly. All right. I've noticed the growing closeness between you. See, but if you notice also, he does things to challenge them as he did before in the, um, when it was cold inside the cave, right? When he had the rescue, Ain from the dark druid. Hmm? Okay. It might be in the way. Hmm? If you think that, then you don't think much of me, she said harshly. If you think that, then you don't think much of me. When have I ever been other than your right arm? When have I ever failed you? He answers. Never. Never. Then you've no right to think that I would now. I have feelings for Lou. Yeah, she's in love with him. I won't deny them. But I have my own sense. This is as much of my mission as it is yours. You sent me to Ayer to help Lou. And that comes first. I'd never let anything interfere with that. You might think so, Mananan reasoned. But you can't be certain. This is too important to take any risks. Lou will act alone this time. She appealed to Lou, her eyes pleading, her voice urgent. Please help me. Tell him you want me to go with you. He can't. Lou looked at her and wavered. When he spoke, it was with great reluctance. I don't know anymore. I want you, but I'd be a fool not to want to keep you safe. She stared at him, stricken by his words, then she spoke in growing heat. You don't give much value to what I want, do ya? She said. She wheeled on her brother. And you, you, I used to believe that you were always right. Now I agree with Tauta. You are a fool. She pissed off. Mananan drew himself up. His manner assumed a towering haughtiness. I am the guardian of these people. Danu herself has made me so. I'll do what I think I must to help them succeed. If you can't obey, you'll leave higher. Wow. You really have taken too much control in this. She stormed. The chance to play the hero has made you drunk with power. She spun on her heels and stalked away. 
Too choked by her emotions to say more. Mananan and the stunned blue watched her go. It's for the best, the tall man said with great assurance. I would say that was a risk, because her running off emotionally like that, she could get targeted, right? Then he slapped the chart he carried into his young friend's arms. Here, we've got to go speak with the Dogda and Morgan before tonight's meeting. There is much to plan. So that is the end of that chapter. And then the next chapter will be Spy. Ooh, this is getting good. I knew the second book would like um, would get more interesting. Uh, no, I'm impressed, and uh, I'm not easily impressed. I'll be honest. The first one was a little simple. You can kind of tell it's a coming of age thing. Like uh, the author is more than likely a father, right? And this would have been something where he would have directed that toward his son, and through story form. And I, I think in the same way, you use stories to explain, you know, reasoning and wise decision making, et cetera, right? So <clears throat> what am I doing? I am each year, not to mention each uh, individual important task, the overall year is an entire rite of passage, right? And as I said at the beginning of this year again, that this would be a big year. It's 2020, right? Uh, presidential election year, whatever. So the vibe is high, right? Ooh. What do I feel? Hmm. Okay. I'm going to play a little classical and then I will most likely finish with uh, Mandel, we'll see. But this is like totally in harmony because I'm like, whoa, what happened? What happened was Bobcat got very in tune with his path. But I will say, Women have been central as teachers in my life, even when I was younger. And I know why. It's called being raised with a single mom, and that's all you got. I mean, dad's around, but it's not the same. See, music hat used to have a much greater meaning. You know, there was a uh, spiritual potency. As I said again, instead of modern pop culture. within ready for the battle to begin sovereignty of the land calls all I can feel it deep down in my heart and soul
Deep down The crystal came from my heart and soul Deep down they said Show us a wind Battle on the way oh. God is a sovereign team Deep down, deep down In a folk soul
Sometimes you gotta walk alone. Not forevermore. Not forevermore. Where you Deep down they said I know what you did I know what you did Shut in me Hearts
And that is how I view romantic love. Not this get your rocks on and leave her on the side of the road. That's bullshit. That is not love. That's fake horse shit. Horse shit is more valuable than that, in my opinion. At least you can use it as fertilizer. Sounds good. It's got brand new. It's got new strings on it, so those will continue to stretch, right? Maybe uh, switch back to a little classical. I love classical because you can kind of play it forever, you know, in a way. She was right there. Waiting for me on the shoreline Put a dangerous mission in hand But I know how to travel on the road So ride a passage on the way That's what he said Queen of 
Queen of Elder Fame in the woodland I go.